So first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And uh, it's, it has been very nice to be in this conference, especially because of the discussions. I think we are all going to think a lot about that and implement as much as we can in our working environment. But OK, so uh, today I'm going to talk about device-independent quantum cryptography. And uh, <laughs> do I have to touch something? on, but I touched the computer before. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so it's still quite common to find in papers people saying like a quantum cryptography, namely uh, quantum key distribution. Just a second. Oops. Yes, but actually I want to, to start stressing that actually quantum cryptography goes way beyond quantum key distribution. So it concerns all the tasks where we have some constraints, some adversary, and we want to guarantee some minimal assumptions or that some, some things are satisfied in order to perform our task. So uh, actually we could divide quantum cryptography in two classes. So we have uh, protocols that enhance classical functionality so we achieve the same things that we achieved previously classically, but we use quantum systems for that, so we should get some advantage. And there is uh, also protocols that we have quantum functionality, so that are intrinsically quantum. So here is uh, some examples. So enhancing classical functionality, we have quantum key distribution, but we can do also random expansion, leader election, bit commitment, secret sharing. So all of these are classical tasks that we are achieving with quantum system. And also we have quantum functionality, so anonymous state transmission. So we are transmitting a quantum state in a network, or we are doing blind quantum computation, quantum secret sharing, we are sharing a quantum secret, and so on. So uh, here I'm uh, pointing out to this very nice review from Anne Broadband and Kristen Schaffner that talk a little bit about protocols that goes beyond QKD. Uh, so just uh, as I said before, so Quantum functionalities, we have new achievements that are things that we didn't have before. But enhanced classical functionalities, we have the same achievements as before, but with some advantage. So, for example, for some protocols, we can get information theoretical security, whether for with classical resource, we only had uh, computational security under computational assumptions. Also, sometimes we can achieve computational security, whether before we couldn't achieve uh, any, even that at all. Uh, also, for quantum, we have this everlasting security. This means that sometimes we might uh, say that the adversary is bounded during the execution of the protocol, but once we finish the protocol, this adversary can have access to the most powerful computer and any resource that the protocol is still secure. And finally, uh, we also get this device-independent security that uh, is the topic that I'm going to talk about. Uh, which we can relax a lot of the assumptions about uh, the implementation that we have. Okay, so now I have to disappoint because actually I'm going to focus on quantum key distribution. So the title of my talk should be device independent quantum key distribution. But uh, I have to say that many of the uh, concepts that I'm discussing, you can think about generalizing if you want to make your favorite protocol device independent. Okay, so first I, I'm going to motivate why we want device independence, and then I'm going to define the device independent quantum key distribution, one device independent quantum key distribution protocol. Then I'm going to, the, to talk about the theoretical analysis of these, uh, these protocols, and then I'm going to compare some of the previous experiments and tell you a little bit where are we in terms of implementing quantum key distribution, device independent. Okay, so I guess many of you or all of you know the BB84 protocol that was the first uh, proposed protocol for quantum key distribution. So distribution of a classical key, so it's uh, enhanced classical functionality, where we use quantum resource for that. So basically uh, Alice can choose one out of two bases and then she prepares an eigenstate of this base and send to Bob. And Bob chooses to measure in one of the two bases and then uh, he records the outcome. So uh, if there was no uh, eavesdropper, whenever Alice would prepare in the same base and, and Bob 
would measure in the same base, they would get the same outcome. So they would get a, a common bit. So the very th nice thing about this protocol so that we can achieve information theoretical security, which we cannot achieve with classical resource. And uh, yeah, also I have to say like, it's, uh, it's also everlasting. So all the, the uh, cryptograph, the message that we are exchanging nowadays, if people keep track of these messages, even though they are encrypted, and in the future we have a much faster computer or better algorithms, then just because you have the script of the message, you can uh, break what was exchanged now. But in quantum key distribution, we don't have this problem. So even if uh, later we have better quantum computers, uh, uh, the security of the messages that are exchanged, if we use a, a key that was distributed by this protocol, is still secure. Uh, and this protocol is quite noise robust, so it can tolerate up to 20% of QBear. I will defi define QBear a bit later. And uh, so here I'm referring to Wikipedia to tell you that actually it's sort of quite an old subject and uh, we have a lot of commercial implementations of uh, quantum key distribution used based on the BB84 uh, quantum key distribution implemented with satellites and actually here you can find a lot of these uh, discussions and references. Okay, so uh, the problem of this BB84 protocol is that uh, one important assumption is that we know what's going on in the lab. So Alice and Bob need to have a very precise or significantly precise description of uh, what are their measurements, which is the state that uh, they are sharing. Uh, and this is a problem and uh, I can show that because actually there was several papers that managed to hack uh, original implementations of uh, the BB-84 protocol. So here are only some of them, and this is uh, Vadim Makarov, that uh, is the author of many of these papers. Uh, and all of these uh, hackings, they are based on, actually there was some assumption that was not really satisfied, so they just explored it. Uh, so if we are talking about the device independent scenario, what we are going to do, so now we don't need to know anymore what is in the lab or, or the details of that. So before I said that Alice was preparing, uh, I, for the BB-84, she was preparing a state in one out of two bases. Now it doesn't really matter which are these bases. I just talk about Alice has some inputs and then she gets some outputs and these outputs are the key. So here we treat the labs as black boxes and, uh, and that we want to s infer the security of the protocol only based on some statistics of their outputs given the input. So now we don't have these hacking problems anymore, at least with this respect. Um, okay, so I hope I convinced you that it's nice to look at uh, device independent quantum key distribution. Um, so it, it relaxes a lot of the assumptions that I, I don't need anymore to describe my lab very precisely, but there is uh, still some, some assumptions that uh, are present in this scenario, so I, I just want to stress them. So first of all, we have the assumption of isolated labs. This means that uh, everything that's going out or entering in the lab, we are assuming that uh, is this prescribed in the protocol. So in particular, this avoids that uh, after finishing the protocol, the device leaks to the eavesdropper the entire key so because the, la the lab is isolated and we have control of the information that's flowing there. Uh, so Alice and Bob also need to choose the inputs randomly, so they need a trusted local random generator. And we also have the assumptions that the classical communication and the classical computation that they are performed are secure, are trusted. Uh, also another assumption, so we say that they are going to share uh, a quantum state and uh, there is the device, so we assume that the preparation of the state is independent of the device. Okay, but uh, so then uh, what are we relaxing, just uh, to stress again? So we have no assumptions on the dimension of the quantum system or which are the measurements that the device are performing and uh, what makes even more difficult, in particular here, the device could have memory of the previous rounds 
and they could act uh, depending on the outcome of the previous round. So this is what we call the fully device independent scenario. Uh, also in the quantum key distribution uh, nomenclature, we say that the eavesdrop can perform coherent attacks. So uh, the states that they are sharing are arbitrary and the devices are performing arbitrarily. Okay, so, uh, so before I had the scheme of the BB-84 protocol, so now let's talk about a device-independent quantum key distribution protocol. So if it's device-independent, Alice and Bob are going to test the bearing inequality. So here in particular, I'm saying that they test for the CHSH inequality. So the CHSH inequality is some, uh, some expression of the probability distributions of the outputs given the inputs. And uh, it, it states that uh, the sum of these correlators, they should be smaller than two. And then if we have quantum systems, we can go up to two square root of two. I, I'm not going too much in, in details of that because uh, it's, uh, it will not be very important. But we just want to, uh, I just want to stress that uh, to certify non-classicality, so to certify the security, we need to violate this inequality. So only if the, the value of this expression is uh, bigger than two. So for, for the protocol, Alice is going to have uh, two inputs, so now she has zero and one, and Bob is going to have three outputs. Uh, and then A and B are the outcomes that they are going to use for the key. So they have two uh, outcomes for each input. Uh, and for the inputs that are zero and one, so for X and Y uh, being zero or one, so for these instances, they are testing for the value of the CHSH inequality. And uh, here Bob has an extra output because for those who know the CHSH inequality, actually Alice and Bob, they don't measure in the same basis. And for key, we want to have a maximum correlation. So this second output of Bob would be, for example, in the same direction as the x equals zero of Alice. So let's say both are measuring the z base because in that case, we, we expect them to have uh, the same bit as an outcome. So these inputs are used for the key generation and these other inputs are used for the test rounds. And uh, here I talk about the Q-bear. So the Q-bear for the key generation basis, it means like how, how, what is the percentage of the rounds that uh, they get different outcomes when Alice measure uh, in zero and Bob measuring two. Okay, so these are the parameters that we have for the IQKD device independent quantum key distribution. Uh, and the intuitive idea for, for the security of uh, this protocol is that, okay, if we have a maximum violation of the CHSH inequality, then it means that Alice and Bob share the maximally entangled states. So actually, uh, it's important to stress to violate a bare inequality, you need entanglement. So the states that they distribute here should be entangled. And okay, if they have the maximally entangled state, they cannot be correlated to the eavesdropper and therefore I would have a secure key. But this is uh, the intuition for why it should work. But of course, in real life, we, we need to make this properly quantitative. And also we want to tolerate noise because we're never going to observe maximum violation in a, in a realization. We have a lot of noise and also we have statistical fluctuations. Um, okay, so now I'm going to go a bit uh, in the technical part of uh, the security definition, but uh, I hope uh, you enjoy. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's state the problem. What is the quantity that we are interested in? So before that, I, I just go through some steps of a, a general quantum key distribution protocol, in particular device independent. So first of all, Alice and Bob, uh, they share any copies of a quantum system. So here they have different colors to stress that it's arbitrary. They don't have to have to be the same state uh, every instance. Uh, okay, then they use their devices and they choose the inputs and get outputs. So they generate a string of any bits that are the outputs. Uh, and now they, they want to estimate, okay, if there was an eavesdropper in my channel or if I have noise, how much noise do I have? So they are going to exchange some information to, ex to estimate, for example, the value of uh, the CHSH inequality for the device independent protocol, and also the value of the QBAR when they were measuring in the key generation basis. 
uh, okay, so after that they estimated, but they have a string of n bits, but they are not necessarily equal. So they need to exchange some information to get, at the end of this process, the same key of bits, so the same string of bits, which is the error correction part. And uh, note that eavesdropper is here all the time, so she's listening to everything. Uh, and then finally, so once they have the same key, now they talked a lot about this key, so the eavesdropper has a lot of information, so they need to take this string of bits, of any bits, into a smaller string that would be indeed uh, unknown to this eavesdropper. So these are the steps of a QKD protocol. Um, okay, so as, as I sort of mentioned already, so in this protocol, again, in cryptography, we want some constraints. So to the, for the protocol to be correct, we want that at the end of the protocol, Alice and Bob have the same key. Otherwise, it's useless. They cannot use it for communication. So here, I want that the probability that the keys are different is very small. Uh, but also, we want the key to be secret. So we want that the eavesdropper has no information about this key. So this I'm expressing about here with the trace norm. So we are looking at, at the end of the protocol, Alice and Eve, so this is the key of Alice. They share this state, and actually I wanted it to be such that all the values of the key are equally likely, and the eavesdropper is totally uncorrelated uh, with this state, so she has no information. So how distant I am from this, uh, this ideal state uh, quantifies the secrecy of my protocol. Okay, so for, for quantum key distribution, there was this uh, very important result that allowed us to, to quantify this, uh, this distance in terms of some, some quantity of my quantum state before the private simplification protocol. So here it's saying, so if uh, Alice and Eve share this state before the, the private simplification, so when Alice has the string of any bits, and then she chooses some uh, two universal family of hashing functions and takes it to a smaller key, uh, then uh, the distance of these, uh, these two states is, is given by this, uh, this movement entropy that I'm going to talk a bit more later, but okay. But the, the point is what this theorem implies is that now if I want to know what is the length of my final key, so I take the string of any bits to a string of smaller L bits. So this is quantified by this smooth mean entropy of the string of bits of Alice, the any bits before private simplification, given all the information that the eavesdrop has. Okay. Uh, so just before we continue, so I said the eavesdropper is listening to everything, so we need to take that into account. So actually we can split the, the information of the eavesdrop as some, some quantum sign information that she could have, plus all the classical information that was leaked during the communication for doing parameter estimation and for error correction. So, so actually you can split this entropy. So here I only have a quantum state for the eavesdropper that I don't know. And here is the information that was communicated during the protocol. Uh, and okay, I, I would just state that, that actually this information is basically of the order of the binary entropy of the q -bear. So if they have more q -bear, they need to exchange more information to correct for the key. Okay, so now as before, so we can define our figure of merit is what is the uh, key rate that we can achieve. So this is the, the length of the final key divided by the number of rounds that I had from the beginning. And now we know that uh, this is from the left over hashing lemma. We have that this is this quantity minus the information that was classically leaked during the protocol. Uh, and so just to give an idea of what this quantity is, so when my, when A is a bit, is a classical variable, actually the mean entropy of A given E is uh, the best possible measurement that it's related to the best possible measurement that the eavesdropper can do on her system in order to guess uh, the value of A. So here is actually minus log of this P guess. And this uh, smoothing parameter here, it allows you to look not at the state of the protocol, but in an epsilon ball around this state. Uh, 
the important thing is that this makes such that like the smooth mean entropy can be much higher than the mean entropy. So it's nice that actually for the key we can look at the smooth mean entropy. Okay. Uh, any questions on these definitions? Okay. Okay. So uh, again, let's recall that we are in the device independent scenario. So we want to estimate these quantities based on the statistics of inputs and outputs only. So yeah, so we have this very big challenge. We want to estimate this quantity. We have no assumptions on the dimension or, or what is the measurements that are performed. And also in the lab, we have a number N of rounds that's not infinity. So we should take into account also for statistical fluctuations um, of my result of the quantities that I'm measuring. Um, so here I'm going to consider two scenarios. So the first one is these coherent attacks that is very uh, adversarial. And uh, also just as a comparison, let's add some assumptions to the eavesdropper that now is the IID that I assume that the rounds of the protocol are identically and independently distributed or independently and identically distributed. So that means that uh, I'm assuming now before I had that Alice and Bob were sharing this any states with different colors. Now I'm saying that actually every state is the same. So they share a tensor product of any copies of the same state. Uh, but also I need to add this assumption to the, well, I'm adding these assumptions to the device as well. So the device behave in the same way. So that means that the device don't have memory. So it's always acting on the same way. It doesn't depend on the previous rounds. So um, these are the two scenarios that we are going to consider. Uh, yeah, so now I'm going to present uh, some of the available tools to deal with this scenario. Uh, so on, on the first part, actually, it's we have these very interesting results that will allow us, now we have this string of any bits, and we will sort of break into one round. So the first is like for this, uh, for the IID scenario, so if we are saying that the eavesdropper is restricted to collective attacks, actually there is the, this sort of old theorem <laughs> that uh, that says that actually this entropy of uh, of any bits, if I have a, an IID realization, so if it's tensor product of the same state, it's it's basically any times the von Neumann entropy of one round. So so this was very nice, and uh, here I'm. Uh, I'm reflecting that actually there is some second order terms that depends on the number of rounds that I have on my protocol. Uh, okay, so for a long time there was uh, not an equivalent like that uh, theorem for the non-IID, for the fully device independent. And then now more recently there was this very nice result that is the entropy accumulation theorem that is basically a generalization of the asymptotic partition property for when we are in the fully device independent scenario. So again, what it says is that the, the mean entropy, so now here I don't have any more tensor product, uh, any copies, but we observed some violation. So we made some parameter estimation with some of the rounds. So it says that actually this is n times this quantity, which is related to the von Neumann entropy of one round. But now note that uh, I cannot here, I have the same really the quantum state of my protocol. But here, I don't know what is the quantum state in every round. But then the theorem says that you could actually look at all possible states that would achieve this, this parameter that we estimated. So here, the Bell violation or the q bear. Uh, and therefore, uh, I can break the entropy in any times the von Neumann entropy worst case scenario over these states. So. And again, we have uh, second order terms. So the second order terms here are worse than the first case. Uh, OK, so now we solved part of the problem that uh, basically the two scenarios reduced to calculate the phenomenon entropy of one round. Uh, but we still have the problem that we don't know which state can we put here, or the dimension, or the measurements, and so on. So again, for the CHSH inequality, there is uh, a result that was uh, derived quite some time ago that is actually a tight bound to the 
to the Von Neumann entropy of Alice, given the information of the eavesdropper, based only on the violation beta that they achieved for the CHSH inequality. And uh, when I say here that it's tight, it means that there is a quantum state that achieves this violation, and actually it has this uh, Von Neumann entropy. Uh, okay, so here I want to stress that actually so far this is the only no tight bound for the von Neumann entropy of uh, a classical bit given the eavesdrop information as a function of the violation only. Uh, so here there is a star because there is other two bounds that were derived for the von Neumann entropy that are better than estimating just the mean entropy. I'm going to talk about that later, but. Uh, so one, uh, it, we got that for the MAPK inequalities that are multipartite inequalities, and this is uh, an inequality called measurement device independent inequality. But actually the two proofs of these results, they are based on reducing these inequalities to the CHSH inequality. So again, we get that only for the CHSH we do, do have this technique. Uh, and. Uh, it's important to stress that uh, the derivation of this bound was highly dependent on the fact that we have the CHSH and it has only two inputs and two outputs. So we cannot straightforward generalize this for other more complicated inequalities. Okay, so now we have all the techniques. So we can talk about uh, uh, some key rates with some parameters. And here now I'm going to, to focus on some of the results that we presented in this uh, recent archive paper where we analyzed the key rates in the two scenarios, so IID and coherent attacks. And then we compared with some previous uh, Bell tests in the year parameters. So. so here just to start as a comparison. So let us assume that uh, in the lab, in my implementation, I had the maximally entangled state and it suffered from depolarizing noise. So actually I have this uh, state at the end. So Alice and Bob are sharing this state. Uh, and then uh, the QBER and the violation, they all can be related uh, only to one parameter. So here I'm plotting what is the key rate uh, versus the number of rounds that are required for different values of the QBER. So what is important to see in this graph is that, uh, so the dotted, dashed lines are the collective attacks, so when we have the IID assumption, and we see that adding this assumption decreases the minimal number of rounds that are necessary by two orders of magnitude. And uh, the fact that this is zero here means that with this, let's say, 0.5% uh, percent of QBER, I can have a key, but I need to have in my protocol at least this number of rounds so that I start having key, because here it's zero, and then it, I, when I have more rounds, I start having key until I reach, let's say, the asymptotic regime. So these two techniques that I showed you, they, they say that actually they are the asymptotic values of the, uh, the entropy accumulation theorem and then the uh, asymptotic partition property are the same. So here we see that on the graph. But uh, as I told you, the second order terms of these uh, theorems are different. And here we see an effect of about two orders of magnitude of uh, rounds more are required. So here we have uh, 10 to the seven, almost 10 to the eight rounds are required. Uh, okay. So uh, now I'm going to talk a bit about experimental setups, but as a theorist, so uh, a theoretical experimental setup. <laughs> but I, I just want to stress that uh, uh, normally, if we want to generate entanglement between two distant points, these uh, we can divide the experiments in two types of techniques. So one of them are the all photonic experiments. Uh, where here I have a laser that go through a crystal and generates two pairs of photons that are entangled. And then these photons travel far away. So for example, in this experiment, the, the photons were traveling 29 meters on each direction. But the point is, this is my entanglement and this is the system that I'm measuring. So if I lose a photon in the meantime, I have to take that into account as could be an eavesdropper. 
So this is what we call the all photonic experiments. But the, there is other type of experiments that are the heralded entanglement. So in this case, my, my system starts already in the faraway point. So here I have Alice and Bob. And first, uh, entanglement is generated between this, this more stable system that's not a photon, it's a spin made of some, here is a nitrogen vacans, but it could be trapped the ions, atoms. So first, there is entanglement generated between this spin and the photon, and also on this side. And now these photons travel. And then when these photons travel, and here I'm basically making an entanglement swapping, such that then I have entanglement between the two distance setups. Uh, the difference here is that if my photon get lost here, the measurement that I, I've done in the system was chosen independently whether this photon arrived here or not. Because first I release the photon and then let's say Alice can measure X, but she can choose the value of X. And in the meantime, the photon is traveling and then already making the entanglement swapping. So the important point is that if I have a photon loss here, I can simply ignore this round. So it doesn't affect my parameters. Um, Okay, so that these are the main difference between these uh, experiments. Uh, okay, so this graph is uh, sort of summarizing the key rates that we can get. There is quite a lot of information here, so I'm going to explain a bit slow. Um, so the red area here means that uh, it's a forbidden region. So no matter the no so if I have these values of Q-bar and these values of Bell, Bell violation, so here we have Bell violation and here the Q-bar. So if I'm here, no matter how many rounds I have in my experiment, I cannot have key one a single bit of key. On the other hand, if I'm in the green area, yes, I can have key, but we have seen that uh, we need a minimal number of rounds. So this is what is represented by these curves here. So here, for example, I need 10 to the 10 rounds. If I'm above this area, oh, sorry, if I'm here and then below I need more. If I'm here, I need 10 to the 7. So if I'm with parameters here, 10 to the 7 are enough. But if I'm on this area, I need more than 10 to the 7. Okay. Uh, so here are some of the previous Bell experiments that uh, closed at least the detection loophole. So one to four, they close the detection loophole, and five to eight are completely loophole free, meaning they close the detection and the locality loophole. Uh, so in this area are the all photonic experiments, and more in this area are the heralded uh, entanglement experiments. Uh, so it's very nice, we have one point that was uh, the experiment uh, uh, in 2010, that they made like a, it was actually a, an experiment of random generation. Um, and they get quite high Bell violation. Uh, okay, here I actually have to say that in all these experiments, they were interested in doing a Bell test. So for Bell tests, you don't need to estimate the Q-bear. So here we sort of uh, estimated the Q-bear. So this is actually, uh, this part here it would be a lower bound on the Q-bear. Um, and here in nine, so actually in the paper we discuss a bit, so this is was the loophole free bell tests are the seven and the five and six. And then we discussed some um, improvements on these NV centers to take uh, on this experimental setup and then we get this point nine. Uh, okay, so uh, for, for this N here, we are in the, fully device independent, and I mentioned if we add the IID assumption, we actually decrease the number of rounds. So this is what we can see in this other graph. So if you note here, we are in 10 to the seven, and now here we are in 10 to the five. So the other points, they remain the same uh, position, but then we decrease the number of rounds that are necessary to, to generate key. Uh, okay, but on this, uh, Okay, th these points here, they are not talking about what is the entanglement generation rate or what is the distance of my setup. So this we also need to take into account. So, okay, so in this table, I'm going to present a bit of the data. Uh, just to give an example that uh, 
Actually, for example, the Pironio experiment is here. If we are IID, we need uh, almost 10 to the 7, but something 10 to the 6 rounds. 10 to the 6 sec seconds is 11 days, just as a reference. So um, here we can see that a very good advantage of the photonic experiments that they have very high generation or uh, entanglement generation. So they can generate 10 to the 5 events per second. Uh, however, they get a very low violation and high Huber. But on the other hand, the uh, heralded experiments, they can get very high parameters, but then we have a really huge problem of the, the rates of generation. So, for example, in the Pironio one, that is the one with highest parameters, uh, we have one entangled event per eight minutes, uh, and the setups are separated by one meter, so uh, the bell test in Delft, the setups were much further away, but then they needed one hour per entangled event. Uh, and this is a more recent one, so they, they have a quite distant uh, setups, and they, they need one minute per event. So, okay, so finally, I just want to, to mention a few things. So ca can we do better on the theoretical side. So what would mean better? Better would mean either I have a higher rate or I have I can tolerate more noise or we've seen that actually the smaller number of rounds that are required is also a big problem so can we improve that? Uh, so here I have to mention recently there was a improvement on the entropy accumulation theorem and this improvement refers to the second order term but at the moment, actually, it's not clear. So I was actually talking to Peter about that. It's not clear whether uh, this would be better than the technique I used for the other one. Because it, this improves the general theorem, but for the CHSH inequality, there was already an improvement. So uh, it's unclear whether this would decrease the number of rounds from the graphs that I've shown to you. Uh, so I, I would like to mention, so with my master's student, we've been analyzing what if we use other bare inequalities. Uh, okay, so a problem of other bare inequalities, so I've mentioned before that uh, the bound on the von Neumann entropy for the HSH inequality was very much dependent on the fact that you have two inputs and two outputs. So it's not easy to generalize this bound, but we can get uh, an easily estimation for the von Neumann entropy by using the mean entropy, actually by using the p guess. This easily here means that uh, we could compute that, and uh, the computation would be uh, SDP problem using the NPA hierarchy, so just saying that you could compute that on the computer, not for too many inputs to outputs, but there is a method. Um, whether this quantity, there is no method to calculate, so actually Peter will be the last talk of this session. He will talk a bit more, yes, about uh, mean entropy bounds for all the bare inequalities in the context of random exp expansion, so stay for the talk. Uh, but we already know that it can be the case that actually the mean entropy is a very bad bound, a very poor estimation of the von Neumann entropy. And we can see that from for the CHSH inequality. So uh, here on the left, we have uh, the value of the entropy of Alice given the information of Eve as a function of the Bell violation. So we see that the mean entropy is smaller than the von Neumann entropy, uh, strictly smaller for all the, the points except the extremal points. And here on the side, I'm uh, representing, so what if we have that uh, standard uh, depolarizing implementation? And I'm calculating the key rate, saying that uh, the eavesdropper information is given by the H mean or is given by the von Neumann entropy. So here we see that actually if I use the H mean, I would conclude that uh, I could tolerate 5.1% of QBER. And actually with the von Neumann entropy, we can go to, sorry, 5.2 and we can go to 7.1. Anyway, it's uh, more noise resistant and the key rate asymptotically is high for all the other values. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to mention a few examples, uh, but the spoiler is already that uh, <laughs> we are not going to get better, but I, I just want to mention some interesting examples. 
So first of all, we consider this inequality. So it's called the tilted CHSH inequality, so it has a, an extra marginal term. Um, the interesting thing about this inequality is that it's maximally violated by a state that is not the maximally entangled one. So you can adjust this alpha such that whatever theta you pick here, you have an alpha such that this state maximally violates this inequality. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that the mean entropy of this state with respect to the violation of this inequality is one if the inequality is max maximally violated. So Basically, uh, it was shown in this paper that you could get one bit of randomness with almost separable states because you could just uh, adjust this state. So the question is, can we use then this inequality to get uh, one bit of uh, key uh, device independently for almost separable states? So uh, we consider like some, uh, again, so I pick the state that has some theta. Uh, and then adding depolarizing noise. So in this graph, we are showing like, so we are adding a little bit of uh, depolarizing noise. So this is the parameter. Um, here I'm varying the value of theta. And for each theta, the red curve shows I pick the best inequality that gives the maximum violation for this theta. And I calculate the, what is the key I can achieve if I look at the mean entropy with this inequality. So this is the red curve. And here we see that in if instead I would just look at uh, what is the violation of the CHSH that this state achieves and then calculate the, the key using the CHSH, I see that it's always much better. The pink curve here is if instead I was using the mean entropy for the CHSH. So, so it was a bit surprising and the reason why this happened is, is that Okay, so when I'm calculating the key rate, this term is almost one because the state has just a little bit of noise. But the leakage for the error correction, actually it's quite high. And the reason for that is that once you specify that you want to maximally violate this inequality, you cannot measure uh, Alice's zero measurement. It's not in the Z-basis. And here we see that the states are maximally correlated in the Z-basis. So if they cannot use the Z-base, they were going to have a higher q bar. Therefore, they need to send more information. So that was the reason why this was coming here. Um, maybe I will skip this one. I just uh, want to mention, so we all also looked into, OK, maybe we can reduce the minimum number of rounds. And uh, this was the only example that we could find but here we are comparing, so we took uh, uh, an inequality that has uh, three outputs. Actually, it's the variation of the CGLMP that was presented in this paper, where the maximum violation of this inequality is for the maximally entangled state of dimension three. So let's say, so here in every round, I generate one treat of uh, key, so not one bit. Uh, and here we are comparing these two implementations can argue whether it's fair or not, but uh, I'm just saying that it's two different states. I'm picking the max, the state that maximally violates CHSH and the state that maximally violates this inequality and add some amount of noise. Uh, and then for that case, in the very low noise regime, so here, yeah, new is 0 0.01, then we can have one order of magnitude less of rounds that are required. But if we go to the more noise regime, again, the CHSH also outperforms even in the minimum number of rounds that are required. OK, so uh, the take home message about that are three points. So, <laughs> uh, so first, we, I want to say that we are getting, oh, I forgot to say something, but we are getting close, but not quite there yet. So. We have seen that the heralded entanglement setups, they have uh, good parameters. Some of them are even in the allowed region for QKD, but the, the rates of entanglement generation are still quite bad. Uh, the photonic experiments, on the, the other hand, they have very good rates, so that we could indeed implement something, but still the parameters are, are not good enough to generate key. So in terms of uh, experimental improvements, people are working on that. So there has been proposals to sort of add some uh, 
heralding process with the all photonic systems. So we only have photonic systems, but we can have two sources and make heralding. So this will improve the parameters, but we will also decrease the rates of the photonic uh, systems. And for the heralded entanglement setups, they also have some uh, attempts. So either there is some frequency conversion or puts the system inside the cavity so that they could increase these uh, generation rates. But so far, it uh, has not been reported any good success such that they keep the parameters good enough to, to have uh, key generation. Uh, so we've talked about the use of other bell inequalities. That uh, the problem with that is that we can only bound the mean entropy, and this can we know that it can be too pessimistic if we compare it to CHSH. So CHSH so far is the most noise tolerant and also give the better rates and uh, high noise resist and in the also give the better rates and minimal number of rounds if we are in the high noise regime. So yeah, we still need to find a better one or if it exists or not. So before I finish, I just want to go back to stress that uh, again, so quantum crypto goes beyond QKD. So uh, please don't forget that. We have many interesting protocols. And I would like to advertise something. So about these interesting protocols, we have been preparing like in Delft in collaboration with Elham Kashev's group uh, quantum protocol zoo, where the intent is to catalog protocols and characterize the resource that are required for implementation. So the idea is to launch that in the beginning of next year, and at some point it will be open for people to collaborate and add the protocols as well. Um, I just want to show the people in Delft that uh, I collaborate with. So here is Jeremy and Suzanne that are also in this paper of QKD. Suzanne is the experimentalist, and Jeremy is a PhD student uh, in our group. We have uh, Victoria and Bas that are also collaborating in this uh, protocol library. And uh, Kanvi is a, was a master student, so now graduated in, and is in the industry. And Stephanie and Roland are the PIs from our groups. And thank you. Questions? Klausia, I think I missed something. In the plot that you showed the key rate versus the rounds, how are you calculated the key rate? You are not included the entanglement generation rate, are you? Uh, no. Uh, so, so there isn't any distance here. So here you're just, what, what is the, the key rate here? So the key rate is the number of uh, final bits that I get given the initial number of bits. So, so it's not in terms of time. It's uh, like the number of bits, the fraction of bits that I will get uh, once I needed to generate n. But if you need to know it in terms of time, then indeed you have to take into account the... Uh, but this is not included. No, this is just the fraction of the final key divided by the initial number of rounds. Yeah, indeed. Hey, thank you for your nice talk. I also have a question about your plots, but the later ones, because you said yourself that most of these papers were not doing QKD. They were just they trying were to violate CHSH. Yeah. So how did you actually estimate this Q bar, right? Yeah. Because obviously there's the third measurement missing from Bob's on Bob's side, right? That's yes. They what they didn't do. Uh -huh. So. Okay. So yeah, the third measurement is missing. So in some of these papers, they report what was the quantum state, and then you know from the Bell test what was the measurement that they were using. So you can. So here we optimized over all possible values for all possible directions for Bob to measure, mm -hmm. and also take into account the detection efficiency. So uh, apparently, actually, I in I the so lab, it's not <laughs> simple at all, right? Like to get these estimates of Cuber. Like this was not a simple method. You actually had to work hard to get this sort of. Uh, I said it's a lower bound because we only took into account the detection efficiency and the state when it was reported. But uh, then it's a simple optimization. 
But uh, again, it could be that the implementation, there is other problems and they cannot get the best out of these bases that yeah. are we are using. So we, we use the reported detection efficiency of these experiments to estimate that, but yeah. And maybe one more non-technical question, like do you believe that this is ever going to be practical? Because <laughs> I mean, we see that people are trying, but it doesn't look so good. Yeah. I mean the device independent version, of course. Uh-huh. Well, I think in, okay, in terms of uh, rates, so for example, the estimation is that once they put these systems inside a cavity, they will get a, a 10 to the 3 uh, improvement of order of magnitude of improvement in the key generation rate, so. I know, but <laughs> if, if this is ever going to be a real technology, then the number of keys you need to actually generate is like huge. Right? on the internet scale. And yes, uh, can you yes. imagine people having these cavities on their desks or uh, it's not <laughs> really a practical thing? Yeah, so, okay, I, I believe that maybe the IQQD by itself only no, but we can think about combinations where you use a bit of the IQQD and you compose with some classical protocol that has some computational security assumption. That definitely, I think it's possible. And also note that once you reach the regime of a uh, key, you very easily go to the asymptotic key rate. So you generate many bits in the end. It's not that you wait 10 to the seven rounds and have one bit of key. So you have quite a lot, but yeah, of course, it's not comparable to classical schemes, so. <laughs> More questions? I have one question. Um, you uh, show us a list of, of assumptions that you still have in this device independent Mm -hmm. um, and from all of this uh, data that you analyzed, do you uh, have an, uh, an idea of, of how good these assumptions are met or if there is one that is still weak that we should care about in order to avoid that attacks, for example? Uh, yes. Uh, so I wanted to go to the assumptions. I don't know if I, it was before. Yes. So. I would say the most problematic one is this last one, that the source of states is independent of the measurement device. So the way I described here, I said Alice and Bob have any systems. So if they want to, to make the protocol like that, you need to generate the N systems in the beginning. So they have to have this huge memory to keep the systems in order that they are going to do later the, the measurements in a sequence. So this is impractical. So what they actually do in the lab, they generate one, one round and then they do the measurement and then they generate another round. And the point is that the source should be independent of the measurement device, but normally the source, for example, in the, it actually in all the experiments, you have optical connections between the source and the device during all the experiments. So there could be something being exchanged. For example, in the heralded entanglement systems, the the source is actually the diamond, is the atom, is the ion trap, and the measurement is also performed there. So then you need to still care about why can you really assume that these events are independent. So I would say this is the most problematic one. The others, yeah, are okay. More questions? <laughs> so let's thank Glaucia again. Thank you.